Father God, you are an awesome God. Father, we thank you so much for the awesomeness that you have in the love that you share with us. Father, in the awesomeness that you have in how you create each and every one of us exactly the way you want it. The Father, you make no mistakes that each and every one of us is wonderfully created by your hand. Each and every one of us is created for a purpose. Each and every one of us created to love one another as you've loved us. So, Father, as we come to you today, we thank you so much for those people you have put in our lives Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share your love with all of those around us. Father, we thank you for the people who have poured their lives into us that would make us who we are today. But Father, most of all, we thank you for the people that you will bring into our lives this week. Unexpected encounters that you would have us to share your love with them. Father, we pray that you would give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear those opportunities. That, Father, no one, no one would feel that they are not loved, not only by their God, but by us. Father, we do pray that you would draw us closer to you that you would draw us to a closer walk with thee. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us each and every day, blessings that we don't deserve, but you continue to give us because you love us. Father, most of all, we thank you for the opportunity today to be here, to worship together. Father, we thank you for your willingness to give to us your son, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your being willing to leave your throne in heaven, to come and walk earth as a man, to show us the example of what it would be like to walk closely with you, to take our sins to that cross, to die an earthly death, but not to stay in that tomb. To raise from the dead, that we would know that we know that we know that our opportunity to spend eternity in heaven is through that relationship with you. So Father, it is out of that love and that respect that we have for Jesus that we come to you and lift up the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to continue in worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Just want, if you are a guest with us, to know that your gift to us today is being here with us. And we're so, so glad that you are here. So while Esther and Ken give us special music, the ushers will take up the offering. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some day for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some day for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some day for a crown. Praise God for all the saints flow. Praise Him what creatures here below. Praise Him all And so, Almighty God, we thank you for all that we can offer to you to build your kingdom. 
Lord, we pray that we might shine like lights in the middle of this generation, that we might call them to your love and your truth. Lord, that you might use your body here and everywhere to stand for life, to share your love, and to live in such a way that others might see you in and through us. We thank you now for all these good gifts and all who gave them, and pray your blessing upon them in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We invite you to remain standing as we'll continue to sing and worship together as we do that. If you're young and would like to head out to learn about our blessed Savior, Miss Barb is over there by the door, and uh, you can head out to Lamb's this morning. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more than their beauty sing, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Today, we continue in our gospel reading from Luke 24. Join us in your Bible and sermon notes, whether paper or electronic, as we pick up the story of the walk to Emmaus found in Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. After Jesus' death, two of his disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus when Jesus came up to them. Not recognizing him, they recounted the events of the last three days. But Jesus instructed them, explaining how all the scripture pointed to the Messiah's suffering before he would enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Good morning. I'm so impressed you're in church today. Good job. I'm so glad to have you here after we had to miss last week. 
Uh, it is a good thing to be together. There's something uh, that is within us that desires to worship together. And so uh, in spite of uh, all the reasons you could have stayed home, you have come out to worship this morning. And uh, I appreciate that very much. And uh, as you go out to witness this week, as you talk to people in the midst of uh, our continued winter and cold and uh, Arctic blast uh, to come, uh, be sure to share with them the joy you take in worshiping the Lord and the reason uh, that you come to church on a Sunday morning to be together with other believers. Uh, this morning we continue in a series on the Bible and the Bible exposed up here on the front. We have a number of old Bibles. Uh, this picture that's also on the front of your bulletin uh, is from this Bible that's up here on the front corner of this table and you can come look at it after service if you haven't done so. Uh, it was given to us in 1860, uh, and it was the first Bible received by this congregation. And each one of these Bibles up here has a story and a history. Susie Adams showed me a Bible she brought in uh, today. She got it at a garage sale that's full of notes and names. It's not her Bible, but it was somebody's Bible. And each one of them tells a story about the families and the history they're connected with. Here's a picture uh, of a stack of old Bibles. Let me tell you about uh, these Bibles that are here on the screen. Um, the person they belong to, one of them belonged to his, uh, his daughter who passed away, and so he keeps that Bible. One of them belongs to his great-grandmother Gertrude uh, there that she studied from. Uh, one of them was from his other uh, grandmother who was given, given to her by her father who was a minister on her 18th birthday 100 years ago. Uh, one of those Bibles is from his grandfather uh, that was given to him in the Navy while he was serving in World War I. One of them came from uh, his aunt Mickey that was given to her by her great-grandmother. One of them is a, old, a New Testament that they got in Jerusalem when they were traveling there. One of them is a study Bible uh, that was given to him by the chaplain of the United States Senate. One of them is from his mother, and another one is one, a Bible they received on their 10th anniversary. Uh, that stack of Bibles there was used by uh, Governor Mike DeWine on his swearing in two weeks ago. Uh, and while some politicians just use one Bible, if you saw that swearing in at the governor's mansion, uh, he had a whole stack of them, uh, each one of them personal and a story for him in his life. Uh, when we talk about looking at the Bible, there's all sorts of connections that we might find. And each one of these Bibles up here has a connection to our church or to someone in it. Your Bible will eventually have a story when it's given to someone else. And so I encourage you to write your name in it, to take notes in it, to write some things down in it, because someday someone else will look at it. Someday someone else will read your Bible, and they will find from you the wisdom you write down in the here and now. 2,000 years ago, the writers of Scripture never expected that we, 2,000 years later, would be sitting here on a cold, snowy morning in Wyandotte County reading their words again. And yet God has a way of making divine appointments through his word and with his spirit that we cannot possibly imagine. Uh, back in 1860, John Honecker, the pastor here at the time, uh, wrote in the front of that Bible to us, this Bible is the property of the Evangelical Congregation Upper Sandusky, presented as a present from the American Bible Society. There is something important to us in order for us to read and study and apply God's word. Are you going out to Children's Church now, Gerald? Yeah, I saw you tried to leave earlier. I saw that, by the way. I said anybody who was young can go, and, and I thought Gerald was going to take off, but he'll go make it now. We'll, we'll call you back. <laughs> oh, you're going to go count, he says. All right. <laughs> I can see you all. You know that, just so you know that. Right? There is something important for us in order for us to read and study and apply God's word. 
There is something that changes in us. We live in the midst of a culture that without scripture, without the recognition of God's presence, goes ever farther away from him. We are in the midst of times when there is still a murderous and adulterous generation. And we, as God's people have always been called to, must shine like lights in the middle of that generation. Uh, there's a number of ways that we want to encourage you uh, to study your Bible. If you don't already do that, if you don't even know how to do that, uh, there are a number of resources. Uh, we offer a, a service through the church called Right Now Media, and you can uh, tell us on your bulletin notes if you want, or uh, go through our website, and you can watch uh, all sorts of Bible studies. So if you don't know where to start, we're encouraging you to do the book of John. Now, we're not going to do it on Sunday mornings, but if you don't have anywhere else to start, uh, check out Tony Evans' uh, study on the book of John. We'll print you out the notes that go with it, and if you want to do it as a group, find a couple of other people and uh, jump in. Uh, there's a small group that'll meet uh, if, if the lot's plowed out, which it usually is, tomorrow morning, and uh, Dave Schumann leads that prayer group, and they read a chapter of scripture and pray uh, at 6.30. Right, Dave? 6.30? I, I get confused. 6.30 tomorrow morning. Uh, there's Shane and Steve meet out at Bob Evans. There's uh, other groups that meet on Thursday mornings and throughout the course of the week, along with our Sunday morning, Sunday school classes, the worship night coming up this coming Saturday night, are all chances for us to say, God, help me find what it is that you are speaking to me. Uh, this morning in our scripture video that we watched, we read through the verses from the walk to Emmaus in Luke 24, 27 and 28 and 29. If you've got your Bibles open, I'm going to read those again. And uh, if not, they're in your sermon notes for you this morning. Uh, Luke writes and says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. We're just going to look at these few verses together this morning as we slowly walk our way through this particular passage about Jesus walking with these two on the road to Emmaus. You don't have to read your Bible quickly. In fact, sometimes there is great power in reading your Bible slowly. In fact, some of the wisdom we get, I think, as we get older is the realization that sometimes slowing down helps us understand better. One of the great tragedies of our world today is how quickly things happen. Do things happen quicker now than when they used to? Is that just me? Right? Things seem to move so much faster and so there is value for us in learning the ability to take a breath, to slow down, and to pay attention. In fact, just coming to worship is an opportunity every week for us to remind ourselves to take time, to focus on God, to slow down, and to pay attention to what really matters. We don't get to do that very often. And life passes by far too quickly for us to want to rush through it. So this morning as we pick up the scripture, Jesus has explained everything to these two, starting with Moses and going through the Old Testament about himself, even though they don't know it yet. In fact, Alec prepared a sermon on that for last week and then you missed it. Because I canceled church. Well, not really me. Sheriff Hetzel called a level three snow emergency, which meant you all would have been arrested if you came to church. Not really, but uh, I'm going to have Alec preach that sermon in two weeks to you. So just know that we're going to come back to those verses and uh, Alec is going to preach to us in two weeks on the fact that Jesus did Bible study with his disciples 
starting with Moses and working all the way through the prophets. So Jesus had explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, and as Jesus as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. That, that sounds like such a strange thing that Jesus would do. Here's Jesus walking with these two uh, on the road to Emmaus, having explained everything to them in the prophets and in Moses about who he was. And as they reach the end of this journey, so keep in mind now, they've walked seven miles to Emmaus. That's 91 laps around the Family Life Center, right? I hope most of you have come in during the cold weather and gotten your exercise. 91 laps would be uh, as far as it is from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And when they get to the end of their journey, instead of telling them who he is, Jesus acts as if, continues on. In fact, uh, this is one of those moments where this passage was so confusing, I went out to use some of the resources that uh, we have out there on the small groups board. I want to see, what, what exactly does it mean that Jesus acted as if he was going to continue on? And it actually has the impression that Jesus pretended. Uh, he, was, he was not really planning to keep walking, but he was acting as if he was going to continue on. Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus pretend to do anything? He wanted to be invited. Yes. Next point. <laughs> he want, that's what Bertha said. He wanted to be invited. That's exactly right. Welcome to Bible study. Right? Jesus continued on as if he were going to keep walking to reveal, at least in part to us, the character of God. The character of God does not beat down your door in order to force himself into your life. Wouldn't that be easier for all the people who didn't know Jesus just to say, listen, I'm going to give you Jesus and I'm going to make you come to church and I'm going to hit you over the head with your Bible and I'm going to require you to show up and to love God. That would make life so much, at least in some senses, so much easier for us. But that is not the character of God and that is not the love that God has for us. God loves us enough to allow us to choose whether or not we follow him. And that is a difficult kind of love to have. Because in our own minds, we think, if I loved you, I would make you do what you're supposed to do. And God says, I love you enough that I'm going to let you choose. Now, if you've ever believed that faith was something that somebody else required you to have, I have a difficult challenge for you today. And that is, no one else can make you have faith. You have to decide on your own. Uh, we cannot put God in a box. We cannot say, well, this God is how you have to do it. There will be occasions. In fact, the very next scene we have in the upper room is Jesus walks through a locked door in order to be with the disciples. In this particular instance, Jesus pretends as if he's going to keep on walking in order to allow these two to do what, Bertha? Invite him in. In the next scene, Jesus is going to walk through a locked door in order to show the disciples that it's really him. We cannot assume that we know how God is going to act. We can only be obedient and faithful to follow God where he calls us, when he calls us, and how he calls us. Jesus constantly gives us opportunity to be faithful to where he calls us next. 160 years ago, when we got that Bible, it came to us in German. We met in a, in a little uh, building they had erected uptown that was 30 feet by 40 feet. 30 feet by 40 feet. All right? Eventually, they outgrew it. So they built a beautiful building uptown that... 
a number of you in this room attended. We got this Bible over here that sat on the pulpit. And eventually, you outgrew it. And in that moment, I just imagine that sense in, in those years, when as you kept step with the Holy Spirit, God presented the invitation that God was prepared to continue to walk on. God will accomplish his mission with or without us. And yet he gives us the opportunity to decide whether or not to invite him in. And so now you worship in basketball hoops, chairs instead of pews, English instead of German. I do not know what God will do next with us, but I know that our role is to be faithful to listen as we walk with him and to continue to keep step with the Holy Spirit. They walked with him for those seven miles, and as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. Now, that's also just customary. It would be rude to invite yourself in. So partly the author is conveying that, that Jesus was following the customs of the day in order to give the two the chance to be gracious hosts. But it wasn't just their desire to be a gracious host. There was something about this stranger that wanted, that made them want him to stay. And so as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us. Stay with us. Stay with us. Have you ever been in a place with a person or a group of people that you wish would not end? Now, this is where I've got to tell you the challenge of church is to try to be that kind of place. And so the danger of every sermon is to make sure you get done soon enough that people say, wow, I wish it would keep going. All right, that's the challenge. Or to at least have the kind of fellowship and worship where you say, boy, I feel like I, feel like I don't want it to end. They did not know that it was Jesus with them. And yet there was something about the presence of that stranger that made them want strongly for him to stay with us. When Pamela talks about uh, the buddy break night coming up, I can guarantee you that there are children and parents and then volunteers who at the end of that very short two hours say, boy, I wish it would keep going. I guarantee you there are times in our lives, in the most important and urgent moments that we spend with people, that we think to ourselves, I wish it would keep going. When we spend time with Jesus, there is something in our spirit that says, I wish we could have more time together. And in those moments, Jesus is working on our hearts that we want him to stay with us. This is the ultimate chance for invitation. Jesus will not require us to stay with him. In fact, the definition of hell is our willingness to reject God. God does not on his own, send anyone into damnation. But he gives people the choice whether or not to decide to invite him into their lives. To invite Christ to stay with us. Now partly when we look just a little bit farther into the story, we realize that they knew there was something else going on. In verse 32, they're going to look back at their walk with this stranger and they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scripture to us? Uh, to have our hearts burning, 
is part of the experience of what it is for us to find God, to know Jesus. It is one thing for us to be close to Jesus. It is another thing for us to say, I was feeling my heart burning while I was with him. Uh, the Methodist movement as a whole was started by a guy named John Wesley. Uh, John Wesley had a heartwarming experience, he called it, on May 24, 1738. In 1738, John Wesley was uh, in his late 30s. Uh, he had struggled through college because he wanted to do Bible study and he had a very strict uh, sort of means of making sure people did what they were supposed to do. They fasted on certain days. They did Bible study every morning. They lived a very holy life. In fact, they were called the Holy Club at Oxford. To make fun of them, people called them Methodists because they had a method to do everything. And yet in all of that work as a Methodist, John Wesley still had no enthusiasm for Christ. He had come to America because he thought if he was a missionary, that might be enough for God. He got involved in a relationship while he was here in America. It got him into so much trouble, he had to go back to England. He failed as a missionary. He had failed in his relationships. His faith had grown cold. You wonder how could a guy like that start a movement of people who still continue even today to read the scripture and to study God's word. John Wesley was invited to a prayer meeting on a Sunday night. At the prayer meeting, they were reading Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. That's all they were doing. They opened a commentary and began to read it verse by verse about what that meant. Martin Luther had changed the world in his understanding of grace that God gave. That there was not enough work that you could do in order to earn your salvation. And in the midst of reading that commentary, John Wesley would write in his journal, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did in Christ alone. I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that, had taken, that he had taken away my sins, even mine. And saved me from the law of sin and death. Have you had a heart warming experience? Have you been someplace where, in the midst of worship or prayer or scripture reading, somehow your heart burned within you? In the midst of all that we do, not simply walking with Jesus, but actually taking that next step to invite him in. Is sin confessed? Is joy expressed? Is Jesus confessed? That's the goal. Oh, there are so many places where I, I know people are walking and Jesus is walking with them. Uh, New York passed a terrible law this week about abortion. But my prayer isn't just for those who make the laws. Our prayer has to be for those who are in the place to have to make that kind of decision. There are a number of people in our congregation week in and week out who are in the midst of struggling. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe the struggle is with cancer. Maybe the struggle is with grief. Maybe the struggle is with a loved one, a, a child or a grandchild. And I believe in each and every one of those moments, Jesus is walking beside us, that the Holy Spirit comforts us and surrounds us. But as we look about this walk to Emmaus, it is not enough simply to know that Jesus is willing to walk with us even when we don't recognize him. But that Jesus is so gracious as to give us the opportunity to invite him in. When we read scripture, it is not enough for us to simply intellectually know what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I, you can know that verse. You can memorize 
the 23rd Psalm. But it's got to find a, a deeper place in your heart. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. You get to the end of that psalm, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is one thing to hear them, it is another thing to believe them. It is one thing for your heart to burn when you hear them. It is another thing to say, Jesus, I want you to live in my heart so that I can believe them. They urged him strongly, stay with us. For it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. The resurrected Jesus on Sunday afternoon has all power. The context of this moment is that they, they are walking with Jesus who has just risen from the grave. They don't recognize him. They don't know who he is, but there is something about his presence that makes them desire to have him stay. And so they ask him. They ask the resurrected and unrecognized Savior to stay with them. Jesus has power at this moment over all of life and over all of death. And these two who don't know him would like him to come into their house. Could there be a greater contrast? The Lord of the universe gets a dinner invitation. Jesus could do anything he wants. Jesus has conquered the devil. He has overcome everything that would hold us back. And in the midst of this invitation, it says, very simply, so he went in to stay with them. Now that, that picture hung in the back of a little Baptist church my grandfather preached at when I went forward. I love that picture there. All right, there's... Jesus knocking on the door in the midst of the garden, right? A number of commentaries will point out there doesn't seem to be a handle on the outside. The only way that Jesus gets into our lives is if we invite him in. And so let me ask a question that we should ask on a regular basis when we worship. Have you invited Jesus into your life. I don't mean have you been near Jesus, because it's possible to live your life near Jesus and never invite him in. It's possible for a church to have all of the form of godliness and lack its power. It is possible to have known Jesus last week and somehow in the midst of the busyness and the difficulties and the struggles to have decided you're just going to walk on without him. It is possible for our faith to grow cold and to forget that each and every day we must live as those who take up our cross daily. And so it is a good reminder for us. I struggle uh, with putting all these Bibles out every week, partly because I'm worried that, that we might actually damage them. I, I, I'm not sure exactly how strong any of them are. They're all starting to crumble and they're not in very good shape. And so the temptation is to simply find a way to put them under glass so that nobody can ever touch them. Right? That's just make it a museum. But the flip side of that is that God's people have a terrible history, especially in the Old Testament, of, of being so careful with God's law that we lose it. John Honecker has long since gone to glory. And so if we ruin the Bible he gave to us because we look at it too much, 
I guess I got to be okay with that. If your Bible gets worn out when you pass it on to your kids or grandkids, if the 23rd Psalm becomes underlined and highlighted and notes written about it and names put in the back of those whom you love who have gone to glory, and if when it's given to the preacher at your funeral, it falls apart in the pulpit, and praise God. If your testimony is that your heart is somehow, in some way, strangely warmed in worship or in Bible study, at the coffee bar or in your seat, at a basketball game on Saturday at halftime or at a Saturday night service, in the quietness of prayer or in the shouts of praise. Do not simply let Jesus continue on as if he were going to go farther. Make sure you grab each and every opportunity to say, Jesus, come into my life. I repent of my sin. And I ask you to live in me in such a way that I might share your love and your truth with others in this broken and sinful world. May you wear your Bible out. And if you haven't opened it in a while, if you haven't read a passage or two slowly, if you haven't dug into it, then don't miss the opportunity today to say, God, help me be prepared to invite you in. As always, the altar rails are open for prayer. As we prepare to sing our last song, let me pray for us. And so, God, I pray for those who have walked with you and stand at this moment in a place where they would invite you into their hearts. Lord, I pray for those who've known you all their lives and simply need reassurance that you are walking along with them even when they can't see you. Lord, we pray for children and grandchildren. We pray for loved ones and friends who are sick. We pray for ourselves and the places of our need. We pray for your church that we might keep step with you and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that you walk with us always and pray that we might know what it is to invite you into our hearts this day. We give you thanks and praise for every good thing and pray that we might be your hands and feet in this world so desperately in need of you still today. For we give you thanks and praise and do it all in Christ's name. God's people said, amen. We invite you to stand as we sing and finish out in our service today. hope you say, boy, I wish it wasn't over so soon. I wish we could stay longer. That'd be great. 
And so you can stay and have some coffee and donuts and fellowship and Sunday school class. You can come back for the next hour of worship if you want. You can spend time with your family or friends. Worship does not require you to be in this building, praise God, but when we are able to be together, it is a blessing. And so as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. From this day forward, until we all meet again, amen. God bless. Have a great week.